I'm CEO of Commonplace. Uh, we are a, a digital engagement platform, um, been going for three years, and uh, we pride ourselves on being the deepest and most comprehensive way of engaging people about the places that they live. Um, we work for developers, we work for cities, uh, we work for infrastructure providers, so everything up to HS2, which we're working with in uh, Houston, um, and smart city projects like we're doing uh, one of the autonomous vehicle Innovate UK funded projects. We're part of that consortium, the one in uh, Greenwich called Gateway. Um, we routinely collect uh, large amounts of data from people who engage with our platform. Um, and what the, the kind of angle that I'm taking today is to look at data privacy as part of the engagement process. Um, and the reason I'm interested in that is because our platform fails if people aren't prepared to give us their personal data. So um, we are signed up with the Information Commissioner's Office and we abide by the, all of the uh, small print of the Data Protection Act, but actually it's much, much more fundamentally important to us that uh, people are comfortable with providing their data to us. So that's really what I'm going to talk about today. So cities are about people. Um, we fundamentally believe that as, as an organisation. It's about the, the, the people that live in the cities, and I don't think smart cities are any different at all. Um, I think smart cities have moved more to include citizens in, the, in their thinking in terms of how they're constructed, um, but I still think there's quite a long way to go uh, for smart cities to think about citizens as really the centre rather than as a source of data. Um, and I think until, citizen, until, until smart cities regard citizens as the ultimate beneficiaries and therefore the people who are in control of the cities, or at least should be in the control of what comes out of them, um, there's still quite a lot of work to do. And we certainly see ourselves as, as part of that. Um, and of course, cities have been collecting data from citizens for centuries. It's, that's, that is nothing new. Um, but collecting data in a digital format opens it up to, uh, to abuse. Um, and opens it up to all sorts of very, very positive outcomes as well. But I think the really interesting question is how people perceive the reason for collecting the data. Um, what is the kind of quid pro quo that people get back when you offer them the opportunity to share their data with you? And that's a question that we ask ourselves every single time that we start a project. So what do people think about data privacy. There's been quite a lot of research on this, and there's actually been quite a lot of research around smart cities specifically, um, interestingly. Um, and there's a bit of a paradox here, because if you ask people whether they care about what happens to their data, they say, yes, they really do care, rather a lot. Um, and they give all sorts of um, uh, examples, or they agree, agree with all sorts of examples of, of why that's important. But if you actually observe what they do, um, you find that there's behaviour which I think most people would kind of understand is risky, like having password as your password, uh, that everybody does. You know, the vast majority, the, there was a, a, a survey by Splash Data last year that found that the, uh, the top three passwords on online sites were 123456, password and 1234567 Now that isn't the behaviour of people who are really worried about their personal data online. So there is a paradox here. Um, and I suppose, you know, one of the interesting questions is, why? Why is there a paradox? Um, and I think it's down to, again, what the value proposition is for people who are, uh, are sharing their data. And if you take the, the example of social media, social media is part of the lifeblood of many people who live in cities and outside cities. They cannot do without it. Many people run their businesses on social media. They run their social lives on social media. And so giving some of your data, and actually most people who sign up to social media really don't know very much about what happens to their data at all. Um, I mean, how many people have read the small print of Facebook's terms and conditions or Twitter's terms and conditions? I suspect very few. I certainly haven't. Um, but the, you know, that, that's felt to be and perceived to be a reasonable trade-off because you need, really need that service. So we're interested in what this means in the context of cities, in the context of citizens, and 
Uh, this is not my work. This is um, from uh, an Elsevier publication called the Government, in Government Information Quarterly. Um, and I thought it was quite interesting. And what it does is it plots uh, two different axes. One that goes from, uh, plots the, the, the level at which data is personal. So is it impersonal or is it personal? And the other which plots whether it's being used as a service or is being used for surveillance. Um, and if you put stuff in the bottom left-hand corner, it's likely to be very uncontroversial. People don't mind uh, data that is both impersonal and being used as a service. They quite like that. Um, but in the top right-hand corner where there's personal data which is primarily, or at least the perception of it is that it's being used primarily for surveillance, is highly controversial. Um, and it's quite interesting, uh, and I've sort of tried to put a few things on here, um, but this is just my personal sort of uh, playing around, really. So some of the technologies that are <coughs> talked about and used um, frequently in smart cities. So, you know, Internet of Things, which can obviously mean all sorts of different things. Uh, in the top left-hand corner, things like Google Maps and City Mapper, high level of service, there is personal data being collected. Um, over in the top right hand corner, things like CCTV and particularly where you're getting facial recognition and that sort of thing, the perception certainly is that there's some surveillance going on there. Police data, which arguably can provide a very high level of service, but from the perception point of view, uh, is quite controversial. So the, 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 bit, the piece that we're particularly interested in is digital engagement and where does that sit. And um, we think that uh, it provides a really high level of service, of course. Um, it does have some personal data because uh, if you're engaging with people, they are, by virtue of the type of engagement, quite often telling you something about themselves. But, there's a big but here, we think that open digital engagement sits over there, um, but if it's opaque, if it's engagement which, um, as a citizen, you do not feel like you are understanding the outputs or you're understanding the use of your data, um, then it actually sits quite, quite often over here. And this is a problem for people who engage with citizens, I think, because you really have to understand the nuance of those two different positions in order to get your data privacy policy and, and how you actually interact with citizens correct. And we all know, um, from a developer or city point of view, the kind of things that, uh, the kind of problems you can have if you get that wrong. So, commonplace is all about a very, very open, transparent way of engaging citizens. And we are kind of quite explicit about that. And um, I guess it's, it's part of what sets us apart from other online services. So um, the way that we engage and the way that we provide our service is that everybody can read what everybody else has said, and that happens in real time without any moderation at all. So as soon as you've made a comment, it's available for anybody else to read. We have quite a strict terms of use, so you can't do various things, the kind of things you would imagine that you couldn't do. Um, and we're very clear about how we put that out. And we're also extremely clear about what we do with your data. So we promise never to share your personal data, um, except where you have checked a box to give you further information about your area or about the project that's being run. Um, and the reason that we have taken this approach is that it provides lots of benefits um, and we think that those are mutual benefits for the citizens, for the communities, um, but also for the people who are changing the cities. And actually the, those are our customers, so the, you know, the developers, the local authorities, the infrastructure providers are the people who pay our bills. Um, but some of the things that, it, some of the benefits it provide, if it's online, um, people can access it any time. We get much, much more take up than standard engagement because people trust it. You can share the, um, the comments and the, the kind of uh, outputs of the engagement on social media, which generates more interaction and more participation. You can get to younger people because they are the kind of people who are much more readily accessible online and they're much, much more likely to take part in something that takes them 30 seconds on their mobile phone than if it takes them two or three hours to show up to a meeting, for example. Um, the way that we collect all this data together and do stuff with it, it, it is all about telling the story of an area and providing um, data that you can make decisions on. So it's very, very, we're very, very focused on making the data work 
um, but making it work in a way that's clear to the people who are providing it. And so what comes out of this is trust, and trust is a very, very easy to, uh, very difficult to earn and very easy to lose. Um, and so that is a highly valued um, asset for property developers and cities to um, develop. This is just a chart showing the, the, the kind of age demographics that we managed to get to through this approach. Um, and this, these are the percentage of the responses rather than actual numbers. So the green bars show the age demographic of a traditional form of consultation, which might be face-to-face -face, um, with perhaps a kind of online form of some sort or a survey monkey. The blue bars are the age demographics that we reach via commonplace. Um, and so you can see particularly the, the 20s and 30s and 40s age groups, which are much more difficult to engage um, through these more traditional means using commonplace and using this kind of uh, online transparent approach you can really get to those younger people. The other things that we found are very very important are to focus on the local so people want to talk about the things that they see every day they want to talk about their high street they want to talk about where they can park their car they want to talk about how they how safe they feel in the area but it has to be about the stuff that's immediately um, uh, knowable and available to them. And so we, we focus our, our commonplace <coughs> engagement very locally, um, neighbourhood kind of size chunks. Um, and we make it really, really clear <coughs> what we're asking people. So this is a, um, an example of a project that we did with Brit uh, Bristol City Council. Um, and this is one of the parts of our platform, which is the heat map tool. And it allows people to um, mark locations on a map and say how they feel about those locations. In this case, they were asked by Bristol, Bristol City Council to um, indicate where they thought there were priorities for change for the cycling and pedestrian infrastructure in the city. Um, and so we've collected uh, tens of thousands of comments across the, the whole city, but broken down into neighbourhood chunks. Um, and the clarity about this was that they had a budget um, and they wanted to hear from the people of Bristol who were using this infrastructure about where the priorities were to spend this budget. So they've been very clear about what it's being used for and they have fed back to them afterwards um, exactly how it has been used. A different project, this is a, a, a developer project, um, so this is a, a master plan. Um, uh, a controversial project because it included some greenbelt development um, and this is again entirely open so everybody can read everybody else's uh, comments. We have comments on here from people who strongly oppose the greenbelt development um, but we also have comments on there from uh, <coughs> the, the whole of the community and one of the benefits of this kind of approach is that you can to some extent reach the, the in inverted commas silent majority. Um, who are people who care, but they are not often the people who will really express their opinion, who tend to be the people who want to complain. Um, but because we are lowering all the bar barriers to participation, and one of those barriers is about being clear about what's going to happen with your data, we can get those people to participate. And so even for these controversial schemes, you end up with a very balanced dialogue, and you end up with lots of people who are complaining and making extremely strong cases about why it shouldn't happen, but you also have the people who are saying, this is needed, it's needed for X, Y and Z reasons. And we play back the outcomes, as I've mentioned before. Um, we use a lot of infographics and because we collect a little bit of data, and we only collect as much data as we need, so um, we don't ask a whole ream of questions about people, we collect the, the really specific data points that we need. But it then allows us to do quite a lot in terms of um, understanding in a bit of an area and telling the story. And one of the great ways of doing that is to create infographics which people can understand um, what the, the broad themes that everybody has talked about uh, and the broad themes of the decisions that have been made out of that. Um, and this is just showing a dashboard and uh, some of the data that sits behind it and um, how we use it. So uh, it's, it's very uh, um, actionable. The, the data at the top is how people responded the overall top left-hand corner and then um, broken down by section of the proposal in this case. And the, uh, the bottom half of the chart is the themes that people tagged in their comments. And all of this is, is automated, so um, it cuts down 
costs and it cuts down uh, time for, for analysing this data and makes it kind of um, readily actionable. So it, it works for uh, anybody really um, who is trying to um, make change happen at a neighbourhood level or at a city level. Um, and we think that this whole approach to, to trust and to transparency is absolutely fundamental to making these kind of projects successful. And I think as more and more <coughs> other types of smart city technology become part of the fabric of cities, this kind of approach is going to become more and more important as part of it. So these are the three principles that we kind of stick to religiously in terms of data privacy on our platform. Um, and as I say, this, this, isn't, uh, you know, this isn't about the small print of the, the, the Data Protection Act. It's about what I think uh, practically and emotionally people want to happen. So making stuff relevant, making it clear what you're doing, why you're asking questions, what influence you can have on the decisions that are being made. Making it transparent, being as clear as you possibly can um, about the data that people are providing and showing that um, it's open so that everybody can see everybody else's. Um, and making it clear what the, the outcome of uh, their interaction is going to be. So um, we <coughs> at Commonplace believe uh, quite passionately about this stuff and um, we're always interested in the kind of projects and uh, the uh, the way that cities are, uh, the cities' ambitions and the way the cities are running their projects. Um, and I'd be very, very happy and delighted to hear from anybody who's got questions in this panel, but also afterwards um, projects or ideas or thoughts about how this kind of uh, approach could tie in with what we're doing. Thanks. Cheers.